Man, my heart is very full today. We've been walking together through the Gratitude Challenge and we're very close to Thanksgiving. The day before, Nance and I are gonna join with all of you who are able to live, seven o'clock California time. And that will be an occasion of great joy. I wanna talk today about how gratitude recognizes two great truths. And one is that every good thing is a gift and it comes from God. In the book of James, it says, do not be conceived. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of all lights, the God who is good. Paul, when he writes to Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 4, says, everything God created is good. Now you think about that for a moment. Every single created thing to, is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it has been made holy, been consecrated by the word, God's creating word, and by prayer. So we can misuse things, but everything that good comes to us is a gift. It is on loan. It is temporary, and we did not merit it. And Robert Emmons writes about this. I want to say this for those of you who are headed towards Thanksgiving. And if you're ever struck by the thought that your life is not perfect, that uh, there are things to grieve as well as things for which to be grateful for, then these words are for you, and they're also for me. This is from Robert Emmons, uh, his little book, Gratitude Works, on page 128. Eliminating entitlement from your life and embracing gratitude and humility are spiritually and psychologically liberating. Gratitude is the recognition life owes me nothing, and all the good I have is a gift. It is a response to all that has been given. It is not a getting of what we may desire. My eyes are a gift, so are my friends, my family, my clothes, my job, my every breath. This is a major shift. Recognizing that every good in life is ultimately a gift is a fundamental truth of reality. Humility makes that recognition possible. A powerful and tragic example of somebody who grasped this orientation, this posture of life, is actually found in the Talmud, which is a central text of Judaism. And it was a woman named Bruria. So it's a story that's quite old. She had two sons who both died one Friday afternoon right before Shabbat. Bruria decided to not tell her husband of the tragedy until after Shabbat, because according to Jewish law, one is not permitted to have a funeral on Shabbat or to openly mourn. There was nothing they could do until after Shabbat. So she kept the information to herself and allowed her husband to enjoy the day. Imagine being able to do that. Explaining uh, where the boys were was the least of her challenges. When Shabbat was over, Bruria broke the horrible news to her husband. She asked him a legal question. What is the proper course of action if one person borrows two jewels from another and then the original owner requests the return of the jewels? He replied with the obvious answer that one is obligated to return the loan on demand. She then took her husband to where their two dead sons lay and said, God has requested that we return the loan of our two jewels. Buria teaches us a life transforming lesson. Everything we have is on loan. Everything we have is a gift. You may have seen in the news, uh, we just lost a wonderful voice from the Christian community. Michael Gerson was a speechwriter for George W. Bush and uh, uh, a terrific uh, thinker and writer in our day. And he just passed away from uh, kidney cancer this week. And he gave a remarkable sermon at the National Cathedral not too long ago, 2019. He led in many ways a very difficult life. Peter Weiner, a friend of his and another great writer, talks about how he had his first heart attack in 2004. He was 40 years old. And then in that same decade, he got kidney cancer and eventually that metastasized. He also suffered from Parkinson's. He also suffered from major depression uh, from his 20s onward. 
And when he gave this sermon at the National Cathedral, this is part of what he wrote, that a few weeks earlier he said, my message would have been much less coherent, although maybe more interesting because I was hospitalized at that time for major depression. He said, during that time I would write down these thoughts. You are a burden to your friend. You have no future. Nobody would miss you. He says, the scary thing is that all these things felt completely true when I wrote them. At that moment, realism seemed to require hopelessness. Realism seemed to require hopelessness. But when you reach your breaking point and do not break, and with patience and right medicine find a fog in your brain begins to thin, if you are lucky as I was, you encounter doctors and nurses who know parts of your mind better than you do. They are the friends who run into the burning building of your life to rescue you and acquaintances who become friends. You meet other people from entirely different backgrounds who share your symptoms, creating a community of the wounded. A community of the wounded, otherwise known as the Fellowship of the Withered Head. And you learn of the valor they show in lonely rooms. He writes about how uh, as a parent, it was so sad for him when uh, his child went off to school and the house became more empty. And he said, it's a striking and kind of humbling thing to discover that the best part of your life is that stretch in which you were a short part of somebody else's story. And so it is for every parent. Every good thing we have is a gift. Every good thing we have is a loan. Every good thing will one day be returned. I've told you uh, throughout this gratitude challenge about my friend Quig. I will say a little bit more about him. I knew him back in Chicago. We would meet together periodically. He was not a flashy guy. He was not particularly well educated. He struggled with his weight all of his life, kind of like Winnie the Pooh. He had kind of a South Side of Chicago, Winnie the Pooh kind of quality. Uh, he would say about himself, you know, uh, I'm not real bright. I'm a Mickey the Mope. And I'd never heard that expression before. Apparently, it's kind of a Chicago thing. I checked it out online and there's a little fictional character, pretty obscure, not super bright, not real flashy, not terribly respectable. That was always Quig's view of himself. And yet he loved people so much. And he was a delight to be with. And even though many aspects of his life were quite difficult, there was never a time that I would be with him. There was never a time when we would meet for coffee or go out for lunch. But what, at the end of it, he would look to me and say, uh, we have a lot to be grateful for. And his life also was taken before it should have been. And I never had the chance to ask him, Quick, why did you always say that? But I thought during this challenge, it would be, helpful to my own heart to remember him and to be able to tell you a little bit of his story so that we could move in that direction. I don't know why it is. I do not know why. I don't know why that even though we think that we will be gratitude when we have more and more and more good things, it is very often people who suffer the loss of good things that develop a heart of gratitude. In the scripture, as you may know, particularly in the Old Testament, the opposite of gratitude is grumbling. And we will read passages where Israel is is delivered out of Egypt, but they're grumbling over their food. They grumble in their tents. And yet when gratitude is mixed with grumbling, then it can turn to redemptive grief. It's a strange thing also. C.S. Lewis used to write about this, that even when we experience our greatest joy in this world, it is always tinged with, haunted by a kind of sadness, a kind of longing that we realize that this world will not be able to satisfy. And so there is this ache, this wound that is in each of us. And often it is people who are most familiar with that ache that somehow are most grateful because they realize that this world is not our home and that every good thing is a gift and that it is all on loan and it will all be returned. Dorothy Bass Butler writes in one of her books about how a particularly powerful expression of gratitude is often to be found, especially in African-American churches, and here's one of the prayers that's quite common. It's offered as kind of a testimony to which everybody is able to uh, nod and say, yep, me too. Thank you, God, for waking me up this morning, for putting shoes on my feet, clothes on my back, food on my table. Thank you, God, for health and strength and the activities of my limb. 
Thank you that I awoke this morning clothed and in my right mind. So, now today, that's our prayer. Thank you, God. Thank you, I have shoes on my feet, clothes on my back, food on my table. That I'm in my right mind. Thank you for the community that I'm a part of, this fellowship, those of us who know we can't, but God, you can and you do. Thank you that you are at work to bring about redemption where I would not know how. Thank you that we live with a hope. I think this was from uh, Michael Gerson also, that very often our prayers to God are prayers where we ask for strength. But even where strength fails, there is perseverance. And even where perseverance fails, there is hope. And even when hope fails, there is love. And love never fails. We have a lot to be grateful for. See you tomorrow.